Hello, I'm Tim Smith, pastor of the Fayetteville Cumberland Presbyterian Church, located here in Fayetteville, Tennessee. And I want to welcome you into this time of worship and study of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're delighted to have you with us today, at whether you're watching on our local cable, Channel 6, or you may be joining us over the internet through YouTube or through Facebook. Either way, we're glad to have you with us as we take some time uh, out from the hustle and bustle of life to focus upon our relationship with our God. I do want to take just a moment before we get into our talk today to invite you to come and worship with us. Our church is located at 1015 Lewisburg Highway here in Fayetteville, and we have an 8.30 a.m. worship service and a 10.30 a.m. worship service, and we would love to have you come and be with us in either of those. Today, I'm going to be talking about, I guess, a little bit how to convince someone that uh, has a lot of questions about Jesus. I know we live in a time when there are probably more skeptics and critics of Christianity than there has ever been. Uh, many of those questions are not new questions that they ask. They have been asked throughout the centuries. But it does seem that there are more today that are skeptical of the gospel, of the existence of Jesus and of God. And today I just want to talk a little bit about how we as Christians can better share the gospel uh, with others and in particular how we can better share the gospel uh, with those that really are not so sure about this Jesus man and uh, this church thing. Uh, today I'm going to be reading from John chapter 1 beginning in verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him whom the law of Moses and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And may God bless the reading of his holy word and incline its hearing to our hearts, our minds, and its application to our lives this day. I'm sure that at some point all of us have tried to tell someone something that was really difficult for them to believe. I know just the other day, I told my daughter it was snowing outside, and she was not so sure about that. Snow sort of a new thing for her. She's not been around that much snow in her lifetime here, uh, certainly not a big snow. But this was not a big snow, by the way. If anyone's wondering, it was, it was a small one to say the least. But the snow was falling, and she wasn't so sure about it. And so I told her, I said, well, go and look. Go look out the door and see. And she went, opened the door. She looked out. She saw the snow falling, and she knew it really was snowing. I think all of us have had that experience. We've been on both ends of that. We've tried to tell someone something, and what we were telling them was maybe hard to believe. Maybe we were watching something on television, and what we saw happening seemed unbelievable. Or maybe it was a ball game we were watching and we saw the score go across and it startled us. And when we told someone the score, uh, they were surprised that uh, the score was maybe as lopsided as it was or about who was ahead instead of being way behind. We have all been on both the uh, end in which we are the one that's doubted and we've all been on the end where we're the one having to be convinced. 
And there is no better way to convince someone than simply to say, you don't have to take my word for it. Just come and look for yourself. Come and see for yourself and see if you do not believe. That is what we have happen in this story. Philip, who will later go on to be one of Jesus' disciples and one of the apostles, Philip had met Jesus. And he was convinced that he indeed was the Savior. He was the Messiah. He was the promised one. He was the one they had been waiting for and looking for. And of course, he was filled with excitement. Many of us can remember times when we have been so filled with excitement about Christ. Maybe it was just after we came to believe. Maybe it was after we were baptized. We were just filled with joy about Jesus. And we wanted to go tell everyone about it. Philip is having that experience here. And he goes to see uh, someone that seems to be one of his friends, Nathaniel. And he goes and he tells Nathaniel, hey... This is the guy we've been waiting for. This is the one Moses and the prophets talked about. He is here. We have met him. Nathaniel, not so sure though, was he? He was skeptical. He didn't quickly embrace the idea that this was the Savior. Instead, he made the statement, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth, by the way, was sort of a backwater not a well thought of part of the country. A lot of people there poorly educated, poor when it came from a financial perspective as well. And after all, the prophets did not say that the Savior would come from Nazareth. The only mention of where the Savior would come from in Scripture is that he would be born in Bethlehem. We know Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and it was some years later, after his flight to Egypt, that Joseph and Mary uh, raised Jesus in and around Nazareth. So automatically, Nathaniel is not so sure. And I don't know that we can be too harsh on him. After all, it is easy for us to sit here and say, well, he should have believed, he should have had faith. But Nathaniel had not met Jesus personally. He had not seen Jesus he had not heard the message of Jesus. He had not been exposed to him. This was secondhand information he was getting. And we forget that in recent years before this, there had been numerous people come on the scene claiming to be the Savior, claiming to be the promised one. And the people would get excited and some people would begin to follow that person and then it fizzle out. Nathaniel, I think, was afraid this was just another one of these con men coming along. And I think we can appreciate that, his skepticism. They just didn't want to fall for the first thing that came along. He didn't consider himself to be as gullible as maybe some. And so he was reluctant to believe. We know that today in our world, as I mentioned earlier, there are many people that doubt Jesus. You know, if we went around our community, if we went around the country, and we asked people their opinions of Jesus, we would get a wide range of answers. Some of us Christians would say, He is my God. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We would say that. Some, though, might say, Well, he was a good man. He was a prophet. He was a good teacher, a philosopher. Some might even go as radically far as to say, I don't even know if he existed. I do want to address that, though. I have heard that from a couple of folks lately, and I think that's really a stretch. Now, I've just got to say it. Uh, I know that there's a lot of things we wish we could prove in a greater way, but... The Roman historian Josephus, he wrote a historical account, and he wrote it in and around the time that the book of Acts was written. And during that time, he talks about the Christian movement. He talks about this Jesus that 
they say, his followers say, rose from the dead. Uh, he does not address whether he believes Jesus rose from the dead or not. But in no way does he indicate that this man, these Christians are following, did not exist. And I think that gives us pretty good reassurance. I think it gives us some confidence that for sure Jesus of Nazareth existed. Now, after that, we don't have the proof we'd like to have to say, well, I can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he rose from the dead and those types of things. But I do think with quite a bit of confidence, we can say he existed on the earth. Now, we know that today, many people, like Nathaniel, are skeptical of Jesus. They wonder about him. They would like to have proof. They would like to have proof as the world uh, likes proof. They would like photographic evidence. They would like more eyewitness accounts. They would like more. And many of them, I do believe, are sincerely seeking answers to their questions. Now, I know there are probably some that have already closed their minds. And no matter what evidence is presented to them, they are unwilling to believe. But we have to remember that being a Christian is, in the end, a matter of faith. It is not a matter of proof. We could give great arguments. We could bring in the Christian scholars. We could do all these things. But in the end, it does require some level of faith. And that is the way God wanted it. Because God came wanting us to believe in things we could not see. It is in the end a matter of faith because Jesus came not to change people's minds but to change people's hearts. Paul talks about we cannot be saved through the wisdom of this age, but only through the foolishness of the cross. It is a matter of faith. And I know that many of the skeptics, many of the doubters, they come up with many reasons to justify their doubts and their skepticism. Some maybe are agnostic or atheist that do not believe in the existence of God or at least in a God that we can understand or relate to. There are also those that say, well, I don't believe in, in, in this man Jesus because I look at the church and I look at Christians and I see how broken the system is. I see that there are false teachers in the church. I see that there are preachers that shame their uh, reputation and shame their principles and shame the church. And some that say, well, the church is just filled with hypocrites. Or maybe they go and talk about the historical nature of the church. And they talk about how the church is sometimes, uh, and sadly too many times in our history, turned a blind eye to injustice and to suffering. And have stood with the powerful instead of with the weak. We all know that the history of the church is not perfect. Neither are the people that make up the church. We have our share of hypocrites. We all do. We maybe are even hypocritical ourselves at times. Because we are sinners. We are broken people. And even though we have been saved and redeemed through the power of Jesus Christ, we are not perfect. We must remember, though, we must remember that the church is sanctified not by the people that make it up. The church is sanctified through the power of Jesus Christ. If it was a matter of Christianity standing on the church or its members, or its leadership, it would crumble and fall. But it stands on Jesus Christ and him alone. Now, I realize that sometimes we enter into discussions, debates, 
some might even call arguments, maybe intellectual arguments, with those that are skeptical. And many times when we do that, we become frustrated. We become frustrated because we don't seem to get ahead that way. We don't seem to win the debate or win the argument. We don't get through talking to the person and them say, Oh, well, I believe now and I want to be a Christian. If it were only so simple. The truth of the matter is we are rarely going to win the argument or the debate. Not because Jesus is not real. Not because God is not real. Not because the gospel is not life changing. We are going to fail in that argument for a couple of reasons. One, as I just said, believing in Christ is a matter of faith. Faith, not logic. Also, also, what happens when you begin to debate with someone and tell them that the way they think or the way they believe is not correct or wrong? And maybe they have thought this way for a long time. That person naturally goes on the defensive. Philip talks to Nathaniel, and Nathaniel is very skeptical. Does Philip argue with him? No, he doesn't. Philip could have argued with him and said, Well, now back in Isaiah it said this. Or in Jeremiah it says that. Or you, this is what this man Jesus said. And I met this man Peter and Andrew. And this is what they told me. That they heard him say and what they saw him do. He doesn't do that. He could have debated with him about whether there really were good people in Nazareth or not. All he says is come and see. Come and see for yourself. You check it out on your own and see if you do not believe. See, when it comes to being introduced to the gospel, when it comes to someone coming to faith, I don't believe it has that much to do with any words that a person reads in a Christian book. Any lecture they hear from a Christian scholar. Any words they hear in a sermon or from an evangelistic service. What brings about that change is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit tugging upon our hearts. Because again, it is a matter of faith. It is a matter of the heart, not of the mind. It's a matter of love, not of logic. That's what it's about. And when we begin to argue with people and discuss and debate, and sometimes I know these things can become heated, if we are not careful, we will push people further away to the Lord. Our job is to do more like Philip. Introduce people to Jesus and then say, come and check him out for himself, for, for yourself. We, we do that several ways. One is the old time tested and proven tried way. It's not very popular these days, but just to invite someone to church. You don't have to go through your belief system. You just say, hey. You can come up here to the church or come to our youth group or we're having a special service. Special service is always um, a good opening, uh, a good excuse maybe to invite somebody to come that hasn't been coming. And when they come and they experience the worship service, that gives the Holy Spirit an opportunity to move. Now, I've heard people say, well, I want them to hear your sermon. Or I want them to experience this worship experience. All that probably has its value. But people don't come to Jesus because of the words a preacher says. Or the actual quality we might say from a worldly perspective of a worship service. They come because they experience God. And there's something about being in the house of the Lord or being in a Bible study group or being with other Christians in this time where people do sort of allow their minds, their hearts to open a little bit more than other times in their daily life so they can experience Christ. 
But you know, the greatest way we can expose people to Christ is by our own life. Our own life. Our own testimony. Now, Scripture says that we should always be prepared to give an account of our Lord. And I know that there are some, many churches, some emphasize it more than others, that open up the floor occasionally to allow personal testimonies. And people get up and they share what Jesus has done for them and what a difference he's made in their life and maybe some struggles he's helped them with and, and all those sorts of things. Now, that's a wonderful thing. But I realize that there are some of you that you would be uncomfortable. Maybe you don't like speaking in front of a group. Maybe you're reluctant to share some of your struggles publicly that the Lord has helped you with. Maybe uh, you are uh, afraid that you'll say the wrong thing. Or you don't really know how to express your feelings and your beliefs in words. But you know, the greatest personal testimony is not anything any of us say. That only makes up a small part. I would dare say over 90% of our personal testimony is not what we say, but what we do. How we live our life. Do we act like a Christian? Do we live out the principles of Jesus? Would our co-workers, our classmates, our neighbors... People we're in a club with, would they know we're a Christian? Just by the way we act and the way we treat other people and the priorities in our life and the decisions we make, or would they have to wonder? Or scariest of all, would they look at us and say, well, if that's what a Christian's about, they must not be very much to it. You know, we live in a time where People are not exposed to Jesus as much as they were in times past. Many people, there's a lot of folks, that, I'll just be honest with you, never been in a church. Or if they have, they've only been in a handful of times. For that person and for others, our life may be the only exposure or one of the very few exposures they have to Jesus Christ. And I realize that's scary. Because with that comes an awesome responsibility. Because each of us can either be someone bringing people closer to God. Or our personal life and the way we live could drive people further away. And I pray that we would not be in that category, but that instead we would be bringing people closer to the Lord because our testimony, the way we live, is very important. We don't have to give big lectures. We don't have to preach great sermons. All we have to do is get people to come and look at Jesus on their own. For them to come and see. And I strongly believe that if people will take a moment to come and see. They will have their lives changed through Jesus Christ. Maybe today you're sitting there watching this. and You're thinking you know. I've heard about Jesus but I've got a lot of questions about Christ. I don't know about him. Just do what Nathaniel did. Just be open. Be open. Just pray. Maybe you've never prayed before. Just pray and say, God, you know, I don't know if you're real. I don't know about this man, Jesus. I need you to reveal yourself to me. I need you to show yourself. And then let your mind and your heart be opened to what you may see and experience. And see if the Lord will not reveal himself. Oh, an angel's not going to appear before you. It may not be immediate. 
But in the days ahead, I strongly believe that the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, will begin to work on you. And if you will come and see Christ, you will see truly he is a great and an awesome God. Nathaniel came and saw Jesus and he was astonished. He was overwhelmed. He was humbled and embarrassed. He had been so skeptical before. He would be the first of millions upon millions of people that would be skeptical. But then came to believe. Let us come and see, and see if we cannot experience Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, as we gather together here, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you that you are an awesome and a great God that loves us in spite of our sins, in spite of our weaknesses and our doubts. And we pray that you would especially be with us when those doubts creep into our mind. May you reassure us. And we ask, Lord, that for those that have never experienced you, may they open their hearts. And may you, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to touch them and to show yourself to them so that they may come to, to believe and enter into the great life that you offer. We ask that you'd be with the sick, with those that have lost loved ones. We pray for our nation, especially uh, during this pandemic. We pray for our nation during this time of, of conflict, during this time of uh, anxiousness, and during this time of change in government. And we pray that your will would be done and that your peace would be with all persons. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Once again, let me take a moment to invite you to come and worship with us. We're located here in Fayetteville, Tennessee, the Fayetteville Cumberland Presbyterian Church, located at 1015 Lewisburg Highway. Each Sunday at 1030 a.m., we meet here in the sanctuary for our traditional service. And at 8.30 a.m. each Sunday, we meet downstairs in the fellowship hall with a little bit more casual service. May God bless each and every one of you, and I hope you have a wonderful and blessed day and week.